Hello and welcome back to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar. In this video we'll be concentrating on how the theme of religion is depicted across the tragic play Macbeth and consequently the role of temptation in relation to religion. So Shakespeare wrote and lived at a time when religion remained a hot political issue. Now some 47 years before Shakespeare was even born, Henry VIII had broken away from the Catholic Church and created the Protestant Church, his own branch of Christianity that he remained the head of. Now it depended on who was monarch as to whether the nation was Protestant or Catholic, but by the time King James I is in charge, he ensures that the Bible was published in English in 1611 as he is a Protestant king. He wants the people to be able to read the holy text. Now, it was law in these times that you attended church each week and people were regularly tortured or got martyred for their faith if it was not in alignment with the monarch. Now, Shakespeare is incredibly careful not to mention denomination in any of his Shakespearean texts, but in particular in Macbeth and instead concentrates on notions of heaven and hell. And in part, that's because the notion of going to hell was something that people were incredibly scared of, as you'd expect, but even more so because of ideals like common-held beliefs around the great chain of being. So this was the idea that God had placed you into your role in society. You did not choose. And as a consequence, the role of king was a divine right that God had appointed whoever was monarch. Hence why Macbeth's decision that he should be promoting himself through his own ambition and vain glory to being king, being held in such low esteem by an audience. Now Shakespeare undermines completely the authority of supernatural mystics like the witches with their cheeky, um, tempting ability uh, to mislead Macbeth into his deeds through his own ambition being coveted through what they say. But this text is full of biblical links too. It's clear that parallels could be made between Macbeth and Adam in Genesis alongside Lady Macbeth and Eve in that creation story. We've also got Macbeth's conscience leading to an inability to say amen after killing Duncan, suggesting his guilt at um, falling foul with his temptation. But equally, it's the consequences for the sins of both Macbeth and Lady Macbeth that become the focus of their demise. And parallels can be made there to Adam and Eve being banished from the Garden of Eden. Their language, though, is contrasting in their downfall. Whilst Lady Macbeth appears tortured by murky thoughts that are akin to her living in hell, Macbeth seems to act as his own god and is egomaniacal in every sense of the word, showing his temptation is now his arrogance, not just his ambition. So let's begin with the words of Lady Macbeth when she says, when you durst do it, then you were a man, so much more than a man. So here she's acting as a temptress. It's interesting her choice of verb, when you durst do it. Durst is when you dare someone to do something. So this is her manipulative strategy. Is she in a way meant to emulate Eve here, offering the temptation up as to what can be done? Her strategy is potent. By emasculating her husband here, she's expecting him to prove his masculinity. She's definitely highlighting her desire to revolt expectations as a meek woman. Instead, she is asserting herself. But we know, just like with Eve, it will bear no good fruit. It's interesting to see the repercussions of her words in the words of Macbeth later on in his soliloquy, when he says, we'll plead like angels trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off. Across his whole soliloquy, he heightens his conflicted state of mind and his ongoing fears of going to hell, knowing that his evil is deep damnation. To commit regicide is a way and a one-way ticket, really, to hell. It's interesting the simile will plead like angels. He's acknowledging that heavenly authorities will be chimed in, if you like, for what he's done. Killing a good, virtuous king like Duncan will have dark repercussions. In the sense that he's conflicted, knowing that he's about to sin, is clear from the juxtaposition in the purity and just imagery of the angels who are trumpet-tongued and even triumphant 
in contrast to the alliterative deep damnation. Even the image of King Duncan taking off, that's to murder someone. It's really clear this is no beautiful ambition. It's dark and gritty and dirty. And it chimes back to the great chain of being. So here we have ambition and Lady Macbeth's influence overriding any moralising logic that Macbeth originally had by the end of this scene and act. Let's fast forward now to Act 2, Scene 2. Macbeth has murdered Duncan. And he states, but wherefore could not I pronounce our men? And here we see that conscience is bound to morality in our play. Macbeth's guilt stops him from being at peace with God and himself. I suspect that's because he chose to murder knowing it was an act of him giving in to temptation. Now these words about pronouncing our men have stemmed from him overhearing Duncan's guards, murmuring a prayer, asking for God to bless them. Once again, it's reinforcing their purity and their goodness against and juxtaposing against, of course, Macbeth's sin. The word amen simply means let it be so. So we have to question the fact that Macbeth can't say those words. Is it because he can't end a prayer, knowing it's about his sin anyway? Or is it divine punishment from God for murder that he is unable to say those words because God can't speak to him right now and can't hear his prayer? Shakespeare, regardless, is encouraging introspection and judgment of us on Macbeth through the role of religion on Macbeth's immediate reactions to murdering the monarch. As we fast forward to Act 5, Scene 1, this scene is involving Lady Macbeth sleepwalking. Now both she and Macbeth fail to sleep upon the death of King Duncan. And so sleep seems to be synonymous with peace. She's suffering for her sin and is consumed with guilt in this scene. I've chosen a short phrase from her series of utterances when she says, hell is murky. This metaphor conjures up how she is living in hell, its inescapable suffering and pain is real. Specifically, the noun murky signifies the darkness that consumes her. There's no hope in it. Yet we know this is created by her actions. And it's ironic because earlier in Act 2, Scene 2, she said to Macbeth, a little water clears us of this deed. And now we know that was completely foolish and callous of her because she is accepting divine repercussions for her actions. She's proclaiming things as if she sees blood on her hands. When she says, out damn spot, out I say, it heightens her torment. This series of utterances that she makes in Act 5, Scene 1 are without iambic pentameter, which is odd for her character. And it mirrors her trauma and the sense in which that she is cast out for her wrongdoing. By Act 5, Shakespeare doesn't deny the power of religious imagery. In fact, he asserts it even further. The words of the young Seward in Act 5, Scene 7 are no different. This is a very minor character with a huge symbolic significance. He dies at the hands of Macbeth, and he's seen as a very young man who protests the first of manhood. So he's the son of an English army officer, and he's reclaiming what he sees as his. So when Macbeth says who he is... The young Seward states the devil himself not, could not pronounce a title more hateful to mine ear. Now that shows how much resentment there is towards Macbeth. He's no longer respected, but is seen as a tyrant hated for his evil works, not honoured as a king, but as an imposter. We have to question whether that's the complete re-understanding of the divine right of kings or simply because of how arrogant Macbeth is at this point in the play. And so when Macbeth kills the young Seward, he boasts at his own villainy and his own strength. And he sounds exactly as the young Seward suggested, like the devil himself. He says, swords I smile at, weapons laugh to scorn. 
and it suggests that the temptation that Macbeth has fallen foul of is to believe in his own greatness. And there's not much change there. As it would seem by Act 5, Scene 8, all that the witches said would happen has happened. And instead of giving in to Macduff, his final words are, damned be him that first cries, hold enough. Once again, damned. His inability to surrender is a problem, but equally is his ability to um, believe that he is powerful with evil in his heart. Shakespeare makes it abundantly clear that religion makes for a moral conscience. And when you fail to use God on your side, you only have the devil to tempt you into more sin. Brutal, but ever more present when we look at our tragic hero, Macbeth. Why not subscribe to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar for all things English, literary and grammatical?